Our next guest is having a pretty good day. He turned 30 years old, and his first book was published by no less than Oprah. He is the author of this, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Please welcome Emmanuel Acho. <laughs> Your birthday, for God's sake. <laughs> oh, man. Happy birthday. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. 30th Thank you. birthday today. Hey, Not it's just quite the way to celebrate it, you know? Yeah. Uh, do you have any other plans, or is this it? Uh, this is, how can you have plans that top this, right? Like Jimmy <laughs> Kimmel's asking me on his show, do you have any other plans? This is my plan. I don't know. You could go home and try to blow out candles through a mask, you know, <laughs> something fun like that. Boy, what a story this is. You start making these videos, these great videos, and people start passing them around, and somehow the video makes its way to Oprah Winfrey. Yeah. And then she contacts you, is that correct? <laughs> True story. I, I get a call um, from Oprah's right-hand woman, and she's like, hey, Oprah wants to talk to you. Are you free today? And I'm like, am I free? For Oprah? Uh -huh. Of course I'm free. <laughs> and, and, and so we, we, we get on this FaceTime call, and she's like, okay, it has to be a FaceTime. I just need 45 minutes. I said, of my time? Duh. <laughs> and I hop on FaceTime, and Oprah asked me one question, Jimmy. It's, it's a question she asked all her guests. She said, Emmanuel, I love what you do, but tell me this. What is your intention? Oh. And she always asked, what's your intention? And I said simply, I said, Oprah, I want to change the world, and I want to be a bridge for racial reconciliation, and I think I can uh, and she said, I love that. And I said, yeah, I'm currently trying to figure out uh, what to do. I'm trying to write a book. And she said, oh, books? I love books. And, uh, she does love books. She's and, in a club with them. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah, she, she does have her own club, book club. Yeah. Um, and so... <laughs> <laughs> and so after that, we, we partnered immediately. And, I, and, and of all the teammates I've had playing professional sports, she's definitely up there as one of the greatest teammates. I've had. <laughs> I would hope she's at the top. I mean, come on now. <laughs> Who would even rival her as far as your teammates That's, go? You know, honestly, when you play on teams with large men, you're always mindful of who you offend. And in the event, I was like, yeah, she's the best teammate I've ever had. There might be some 6'4", 300 defensive tackle that calls me when I leave, like, what'd you say, Acho? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. You have to be careful. I think even he would understand when it comes to Oprah. So you get the call from Oprah, and at any point did you think this might be a prank? So get this. Before Oprah ever called me, I got a call from another caller ID number. And it's a no caller ID number, and it's Matthew McConaughey. I pick up, it's 8.35 a.m. I'm sitting at my clear glass table um, uh, uh, on Saturday morning, and I'm eating my Cheerios. I get a call. I pick it up. Acho, McConaughey here. M <laughs> McConaughey, stop playing with me, Teddy. No, 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 McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey. I'm like, oh, wow. He's like, I want to have a conversation with you. He had seen my first episode. Six days later, he called me. He said, I want to have a conversation. I said, well, McConaughey, I'm doing it, uh, you know, in, in four days. That'll be cool. He said, let's do it tomorrow. McConaughey wants to do it tomorrow, we do it tomorrow. Wow. And um, so that's actually how episode two came to pass. So McConaughey calls me before Oprah had ever called me. Oprah called me from a no-caller ID number. Then Roger Goodell, commissioner of the NFL, calls me from a no-caller ID number. So I'm like, what is it with these no-caller ID numbers? Yeah, right. I've learned to pick them up, though. I'm going to get your number and start calling you as various <laughs> Bill Gates is on the line. <laughs> Please don't. Okay, I will. Please don't. So, okay, so now you wind up partnering with Oprah. Yeah. She liked your intention. Thank God. Imagine if she, <laughs> you, she told her your intention. I want to change the world. <laughs> Racial reconciliation. She's like, I hate eh, that. we've had enough of that. <laughs> but um, did you gush or did you play it cool with Oprah? I, I played it cool because it was cool. Okay. For, for me, Jimmy, this has never been about me. I, I do my first episode, 25 million views in three days. That was not supposed to happen. You were expecting just a little bit, right? I'm speaking from my heart. I yeah. shot this with my best friend who's an Olympic gold medalist, a wedding videographer in a all-white room. I'm not expecting to go viral. I'm just expecting to emote other people. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, 25 million views. So when Oprah calls me, I was in the moment. It, it wasn't time to be star starstruck. It wasn't time to think about myself. I was like... Okay, let's keep going. It what happened can we too do fast. To yeah. Exactly. Everything has happened too fast. And now I'm here. Yeah. Like, I'm still, I'm still in the moment. <laughs> Instead of stuck at Fox Sports with my cousin Sal all day. <laughs> I love cousin Sal. Your family came to America from Nigeria. Correct. 
Uh, you grew up in Texas yeah. in a Nigerian American family. Did you keep the Nigerian traditions as a kid? Well, like eat the foods and all of that sort Jimmy, of thing. Jimmy, it's impossible not to keep Nigerian traditions. I okay, see. in a Nigerian household, um, you, you 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 must be a doctor. You must be a lawyer. You must be an engineer. <laughs> Like, right, like, playing football is not it's what not you're on the list. That is not on the checklist of things to do, right? It's like, you get a doctorate degree, it's like, okay, what's next? Uh -huh. um, and so, really? in wow. household, it was just super, I went to an all, predominantly white private school. I was supposed to be a national merit scholar. I ended up being 6'2", 240. I said, okay, we'll play football. But the beautiful part of Nigerian culture is I had to learn white culture because I was immersed in white culture. And then I got immersed in black culture playing in the NFL in college. And that's why I've realized the disconnect that currently exists in America. There's a color issue, but there's a culture issue. Let's address all of them. Isn't that interesting that you learned about black culture yeah. as an adult playing football? It and is football, it, are, are in the world of football, are people closer of various races closer together, or are they, uh, or are they, or is it the same? As it's a really good question. Let me take you back. 2014, I'm playing for the Philadelphia Eagles. I walk into the training table at One Novacare Way. That's where the facility is. And I look up. There are 53 players on the team, so there are 53 players in the cafeteria. All the white players are sitting together. True story. All the black players are sitting together. Minus one player, one black mixed offensive lineman is sitting with all the white players, and there was also one white defensive back sitting with all the black players. And I thought for a second, I said, it is 2014. Segregation has been outlawed for 60 years, but we've all unintentionally but subconsciously segregated our own ways. Now, to really get to the root of this issue, the reason as a football team you can look beyond your differences, religion, racial, et cetera, is because you're all fighting a common enemy, the opponent, whoever you're playing that Sunday, that Saturday if you're in college, whereas in life, in America, we haven't all yet chosen to fight that common enemy. Mm -hmm. Right, where systemic injustice, oppression, racial uh, discrimination, we haven't yet realized it's us versus oppression. It's not black versus white. It's not white versus black. It's us versus oppression and discrimination. The title of your book is Uncomfortable Conversations with White. It's good, you say, to have uncomfortable conversations. I, I'm happy to hear that because all of my conversations are uncomfortable. Are, are, are they? I'm honestly, I'm pretty comfortable. I'm, this is the most comfortable conversation I've had in about four months now. Oh, good. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> um, it is the title because I say this. Everything in life that is worth something is birthed through discomfort. You think about uh, labor pains and what a woman goes through to birth the beautiful child, might be our next uh, hero, or it might be our next Pulitzer Prize winner, whatever the case may be. I think about football, where I come from. You go through training camp, Jimmy, grueling training camps, that's uncomfortable, but you try to win the Super Bowl. If we want to accomplish anything in life, we got to get uncomfortable, but I'll say this, it's only uncomfortable until you do it. I moved to Los Angeles from Austin, Texas. Waking up at 5 a.m. was uncomfortable at first, but you start to do it and it's not as uncomfortable. These conversations are only uncomfortable until you continue to have them. Then all of a sudden, they're second nature. You've got a lot of... <laughs> a lot of well-meaning people, yeah. a lot of well-meaning white people, yeah. uh, specifically, who come to you uh, asking you... Uh, because I think people are confused. Like, you know, I think there's a perception that it, the proper... Uh, way to say is African American. Yeah. You don't call somebody black, and then somebody says, "Well, no, uh, you're, you're not including a lot of different people if you say African American." And black is the preferred term. So you got a bunch of confused white yes. people, and you're here to help us. Yes. <laughs> what I say is this. Um, I'll put it in story form. After Oprah and I had been communicating for about a month or two, I, I send her an email and I'm say, "Hey, do you want me to call you Oprah?" Oh, your majesty, like, <laughs> what do you want me to call you? And she said, she said, Emmanuel, Oprah's fine. Because, Jimmy, if you don't know what to call somebody, you can't say you're really friends. When people say, oh, Emmanuel Acho, I'm like, no, it's Acho. Ocho, no, it's Acho. Because if you can't pronounce my name, we're not really friends. So I submit that black is safer than African-American because black is just an adjective describing one's skin color. Like, white is an adjective describing one's skin color. I don't think black, and I don't like using black as a noun, people is a noun. Black is just describing that group of people. That's why I simply submit, that is safer. But in America, saying black has become like awkward, like, you black? Whoa. You know what I mean? Like, you wait for the backlash. And I just think that we all have to get more comfortable with one another. But I'll end by saying this. Proximity 
it breeds care. Distance, it breeds fear. And the problem is people that don't look like each other, don't sound like each other, they're not close enough with each other. Yeah. Well, I mean, because of COVID, we can't get any closer, but <laughs> I'll tell you, if it wasn't for this virus, Before I, COVID, I'd Jimmy. be in your lap right now. <laughs> 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 this is the book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. It is out now. Emmanuel Acho, everybody. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Happy birthday. We'll be back with Ty Dolla Sign. Thanks for watching. And remember, every time you click the subscribe button, one of your enemies gets destroyed.